Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Padres Corner is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Padres Corner, episode 29, recorded April 3rd, 2015. Good Friday, short Padre. Hello and welcome to Padres Corner. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit. Padre SJ in the Twit TV chat room. The Padres Corner is a place for us to go through some of the stories that may wander past the regular news week here at Twit TV. A while back, Lisa and Leo told me, you know, we need something just for chat room, just for the people who are the loyal members of the Twit TV army. And that's where Padres Corner was born, a place where we put you into the mind of a Jesuit priest and see if you come out sane on the other side. Uh, we've got a, a special episode for you today. It's a little bit shorter because it is Good Friday, and me being a priest, I've got lots of duties that I have to rush to right after I'm done recording Padres Corner, but also because there's been some incredible, and I really mean incredible, I can't really talk about it, but incredible stuff going on at Twit TV, and I promise you, you're going to be happy with it. You're going to love it. It's bringing back a lot of the energy that we had the first time we made a podcast. When Leo decided that we wanted to create something that was different from what you get in mainstream, well, we're bringing it back. So I can't say more than that without giving it away, but just stay tabbed to this channel and to this network because I tell you, it's going to get awesome. Now, we're going to start off like we normally do, and that is with some freaking engineering. Now, I don't know how many of you stay abreast of technology used to take a look at nuclear disasters, but it's difficult. You see, when we're talking about nuclear disasters, and there's been a couple of major nuclear disasters. Off the top of my head, there would, of course, be Fukushima, which everyone knows because that was just recently. There's Chernobyl, which is the worst nuclear disaster, unless, of course, Fukushima gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then there was Three Mile Island here in the United States, which was actually big. I mean, when you consider what happened during the event, it was a loss of containment, just like Chernobyl and Fukushima. Not to the same extent, but still not good at all. Now, now I'm not going to talk about nuclear disasters. I'm not going to talk about nuclear power. That discussion is for another time. What I want to talk about is what we do afterwards. One of the most difficult parts of cleaning up a nuclear disaster is finding and containing the fuel and the fission remnants. In other words, the things that are the most dangerous, the most radioactive. Now, the problem is we don't have really good ways to look at those remnants. We don't have a really good way to look into a nuclear disaster. The problem with doing that is that when you have a nuclear disaster, when you have something like a Chernobyl or a Fukushima or a Three Mile Island, you, you can't go inside. I mean, it kills people. It's not just the radiation. It's the radioactive dust, one particle of which launched in your lungs could literally kill you in days, weeks, or months. Now, we have tried a lot of different methods to get into the heart of these disasters. We've tried fiber optics, but they really can't get close enough. They don't have the directionality that we need in order to be able to get in there. They've tried using vehicles so that you could get people closer with lead shielding, but that's just not really practical. It's never really worked, and you're still putting people at risk. And, of course, we've tried robotics. Robotics sounds like the perfect way to get into a reactor room. It sounds like the perfect way to take a look at what has happened to the fuel in Chernobyl, which, by the way, has turned into something that looks a little bit like lava. They call it the elephant's foot. And essentially, it's the steel and the concrete that melted out of the bottom of that reactor vessel and has turned into some porous, nasty, fuel-containing death toe. Now, it's solidified, and now it's abrading, which means the particles are coming off. And those particles contain fuel. They contain remnants of the, of the fission process. It's incredibly bad for you. But when you try to send robots near that ball of radioactivity, they tend to malfunction. Now, you can harden the electronics at great expense, but even then, they found that it's very difficult to get a useful picture of what has happened to that fuel, what has happened to the machinery, 
what has happened to the debris within a reactor. That's why some very bright engineers have discovered that we can use a fundamental particle of physics to take a look at where robotics and humans dare not go. Now, you may have heard of a muon. A muon is a fundamental particle. It, it, it's, it's created on Earth every single day, every single hour. It's, it's what happens when cosmic rays interact with the molecules in the upper atmosphere. What you get is a high energy burst and then the creation of muons. Now it's estimated that about 10,000 muons hit every square meter of the Earth's surface every minute. Now we mostly ignore them unless you're a particle physicist because they don't affect us. They don't, they don't change our lives. They don't, they're no danger to us or the materials that we normally come into contact with. However, there is one characteristic of a muon that is incredibly useful for people who are studying nuclear disasters. And that's the fact that a muon can be blocked or deflected by heavy elements like plutonium and uranium. Uh, what these fantastic engineers have figured out is if you place an array of detectors around the building, around the reactor that you're trying to take a look into, you can use an exposure over hours and days to develop a picture of what's happening inside. Now, imagine this. The picture is perfect because it's like an x-ray, but the x-rays, the muons, are only stopped by the fuel, not by the steel, not by the concrete, not by all that debris that has fallen into the reactor, but only by the stuff that you are most concerned with, the uranium and the plutonium that occurs because of the process of fission. Now, you, did, you set up these detectors around the building, and over time, because of the shadow, because of those particles being blocked, you can see from the absence of muons what's going on inside of the reactor. In the case of Fukushima, they were able to use this system to determine, maybe unsurprisingly, that there was no fuel in the reactor vessel because it had melted through the bottom. This is still technology in its infancy, but this type of technology has a lot of promise for those who want to study phenomenon and, and dangerous situations that are not themselves really, you know, friendly to the technology that we've developed to, to monitor these kind of phenomenon. I think in the future, we're going to be looking at the use of muons and other fundamental particles to take a look into the secrets where we dare not tread. Now... When we come back, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, something that I hold near and dear to my heart. That's broadband. There's been a couple of announcements over the last week or so that have the, the world reeling as to their significance. But first, let's go ahead and take a look at the tech. This time, I want to take a look at something that's a little bit different. It's not a product. It's not something that we've been playing with. It's something that I, I think it harkens back to some of my very early interest in wireless technologies. Back then, if you wanted to buy an antenna, an antenna assembly, it was ridiculously expensive. I mean, something you could buy from a Best Buy's or a Fry's Electronics for seven, eight, nine dollars used to cost us three, four, five hundred dollars until, again, some of us uh, decided that we were going to figure out alternatives to extending your wireless. And so that's why we at the Twit Brick House decided that we were gonna build a cantenna. When you're building a cantenna, there are a few parts that you're gonna need. The first piece is this, a female end type connector. It's what's gonna allow you to put the antenna rod inside the can. The second piece is this, some heavy gauge copper wire. This, this actually should do just fine. You're also going to need a pigtail to connect the N-type connector to an adapter and an adapter that supports an external antenna. The last piece is the can. Now ideally you want something that's 3.5 inches wide and as close to 5 inches long as possible. Unfortunately those dimensions are really hard to find in the real world, so I've gone with this clear broth soup can. What I like about it is that it's plenty long and because it's clear broth, it's easier to clean. You're going to have to open it up and clean it out, but of course we here at Twit TV hate to waste things. So I've tasked Greg here with helping us to consume all the broth. Hey, uh, Padre, you want to tie me? <laughs> we tried that, Greg. Remember? You kept trying to run away. You can't be trusted. Once you've emptied and washed the can, measure the diameter of the container, then plug that number into the Cantana calculator linked in our show notes. The calculator gives us two important pieces of information, 
how far from the back of the cantana we need to drill our antenna port, and how long our cantana should be. Anything over 4 inches wide is really too big, but it makes it easier for us to show you the steps. Mark off the antenna port location on the can. You should also mark off the approximate size of the n-type flange. You want the flange to fit easily through the hole, but you also want the hole small enough to be able to support the connector. To do this project, you're going to need a few tools. Most notably, you're going to need a power drill and some drill bits of varying sizes. You're also going to need some steel files so you can remove the rough edges and the sharp corners, as well as a soldering iron and some solder. Of course, we're working with power tools, so we need to have safety goggles. I've asked Greg to help us with this little drilling project. Now, Greg, we're all about safety, so remember, safety first. Can we, can, can we use like a clamp or something? You know what, Greg? We probably could. Drill a pilot hole at the mark that you previously measured, starting with a pilot bit and gradually moving up to a larger bit. You want to make the hole large enough to just barely fit the mounting flange of the N-type connector. Once the hole is large enough, file off the burrs and the sharp edges. Clamp the N-type connector, then solder approximately 2 inches of copper conductor into the receptacle. You may need to sand the edges of the conductor to guarantee a clean solder joint. Measure off 1.21 inches on the copper conductor, then snip the conductor to the proper length. You can now choose to hot glue the N-type connector into the cantenna, or use four self-tapering screws to secure the connector. Give the can a rough sanding if you plan to paint it. Technically, you're done. Your can will work, but I would suggest that you give it one light coat of paint to protect it from the elements. Greg, could you make sure that this gets painted? Yeah, uh, so I was thinking, uh, you know, shouldn't I like wear a respirator or do this in a well-ventilated area, like outside maybe? You know what, Greg? Yes, you should. Yes, you should. With this kind of antenna design, you can expect between a 6 and 12 decibel increase of RF sensitivity. Not only that, but you'll get an increase in the amount of RF directionality, which means that if you were to say, oh, I don't know, climb to the top of a tall, tall antenna or a tall building, you could shoot a Wi-Fi link for miles. Won't that be fun, Greg? Please, please no. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Freaking science. Thanks to Greg Burnett for uh, being part of our Freaking Science. You know, it's segments like that that remind me of how much fun we have doing know-how and also how little abuse we've had of Greg over the last year or so. So we're definitely going to have to bring that back. Make sure to watch Know How every Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Now, let's go on. This is not a rant. Okay, it's a rant, but it's a mini rant. It, it's, it's to talk a little bit about broadband. Now, we all know that broadband is what drives this station. If you didn't have a decent internet connection, you wouldn't be watching Twit live right now. You wouldn't be able to download Twit in any reasonable amount of time. In fact, broadband really is the lifeblood of the new economy of the world. If you are in a de developed nation, it's online services that make the biggest buzz. It's online businesses that are getting the biggest profit margins. It's connected devices that are going to sell the most. So if you choke off those lifelines, if you get rid of the lifeblood, you're left with a corpse. Which is why there's a curious fight going on right now between some of the major players in broadband provision in the United States. Now, we're not going to talk about broadband out of the country because there are way too many examples of, of really good, well-implemented broadband policies in countries like Japan and Greenland and Iceland. And we know that the United States does not quite measure up to what they may have, but we do have what we have. And what we have is mostly a monopoly that's been granted by years and years of abuse of acts that were supposed to put broadband and ISPs at the service of the people of the United States. That's not what's happened. But let's talk about the good stuff. The good stuff is this. AT&T just this week announced that they will be expanding their U-verse gigapower to parts of Cupertino. Now, this in itself is not huge. I mean, we have seen U-verse in... Dallas, Kansas City, Fort Worth, North Carolina, Austin, Texas. And they're also planning for Chicago, St. Louis, Nashville, Atlanta, Charlotte, Jacksonville, Miami, San Antonio. 
No, we've seen the service, and we know what it is. We know that it's fast. We know that it could download HD movies in just under 30 minutes. We know that you can get 300 megabits per second for about $80 a month. You can get 1 gigabit per second for about 110 per month. You could also bundle it. For 150 you get the gigabit plus TV. If you want to add phone, it bumps it up to 180 Oh, that's good. I mean, we like competition. We like services. We want these companies to offer these things so that we can have more Twit TVs, so we can have more connected mobile devices, so we can have more Amazon.coms. We want the possibility that comes with greater broadband. Here's the problem. These corporations, these ISPs, these executives were the same ones who just a year, maybe 18 months ago, were telling us, the American people, that we didn't want broadband. We didn't need broadband. We didn't need faster broadband. In fact, it was the CEO of AT&T who said, look, we've been studying this problem for more than three years, and the American people just don't have any need for faster than 1.5 megabits per second. These same companies now are coming out with what could be described as defensive maneuvers to offer one gigabit per second, or in, the, in terms of Comcast, two gigabits per second. They're coming out and they're saying, whoa, 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 we're responding. You know, you don't need new legislation. You don't need to write your congressman because we're giving you what you want because we know what you want. When we really know that the only reason why they're doing this is because they're healing, feeling the heat from companies like Google. Google, which came into the industry with a self-proclaimed non-desire to be an ISP. They never wanted to be an ISP. They never wanted to replace AT&T or Comcast or Sprint or Verizon. They wanted to show those companies that there was actually a demand. They wanted to show those companies, which had for years and years said, no, the network's fast enough, that no, it wasn't fast enough, and that you could accelerate the pace of innovation, and you could accelerate the pace of learning, and you could accelerate the pace of the economy if you were just willing to reinvest the record amount of profits that you're getting into the network from which you get those profits. What we're seeing now is AT&T and Comcast and Verizon in a panic. They're realizing that these customers are starting to wise up, and we're starting to say, wait a minute, how much are we paying? Wait, wait, wait a minute. What are, what are we paying for? Hold up, hold hold up a bit. You're double charging us, triple charging us, quadruple charging us for the same bits of information. We're paying all these fees and you don't really have an obligation to make sure that we're getting the service that we're paying you for? Yeah, these are uncomfortable questions. But these are questions that a lot of other people around the world in developed nations with high-speed broadband don't have to ask because those companies figured out a long time ago that if you don't do business in a way that is good for the consumer, the consumer won't do business with you. No, the companies we have in the United States who deal with broadband figured out that they could work the legal system so that you don't get competition. You only get Comcast or Time Warner, but not both. You get AT&T or Verizon, but you don't really get a choice between the two because one is always going to be faster and cheaper. They're starting to realize that they have to compete. And for all the people who are saying that this is going to be socialism and this is going to be a ridiculous abuse of government regulations, that's what you have to bring it back to, competition. If you want competition, we have to inspire competition. And we don't look at an announcement from AT&T that they're giving us the latest and greatest in broadband. And we don't look at an announcement from Comcast that they're going to give us twice as much speed, maybe in 2016. And we say, oh, look, everything's taken care of. We have to look at that and say, why are they doing it? And if you look at the markets, listen to the markets that AT&T is releasing in. Dallas, Kansas City, Fort Worth, Austin, North Carolina. These are the regions that Google Fiber exists right now. In other words, the only reason why you're getting this speed is because AT&T is starting to run scared. The only reason why you're getting an announcement of 2 gigabits per second from Comcast is because people are starting to realize that we want competition. The only reason why you're starting to see higher speeds is because we are realizing that we want it. That's the end of my mini rant. I'm going to go on. You know, I don't, I don't want to come down too hard because I want these companies to do the right thing. I want competition to take hold. I want the right thing to happen. And I want it to happen because of the right reasons. The right reasons are that we are willing to pay for a service that is worth paying for.
Now, that, unfortunately, is the end of this episode of Padres Corner. I know this was a short episode, but I told you at the beginning that this is a, a Good Friday episode. This is a, an Easter episode for me. I have to go back, and I'm going to be doing a couple of services today. I'm going to be doing a bunch of services tomorrow. Now, it doesn't matter what you believe. I, that, that's, that's all good for me. You're all geeks in my mind. I love you all, and I wish you the best of the weekends. But I also wanted to use this time to make a special announcement. Now, if you've been following me on my Twitter feed, you know that... I've been mulling over the release of a couple of my shows because I've got some new projects coming up. In fact, I've got two shows I know of, and there's a third that I'd really like to work on. Uh, Lisa and Leo are, are encouraging us to push the envelope of what is possible, to really get some high production values in here, because Twit TV only works as long as we keep growing, and we're going to keep growing. Now, don't be afraid. I'm not killing off Padres Corner. We're not letting go of it. But what we will be doing is we will be changing the format. Uh, it's not quite on a hiatus, but it's going to become, as we get closer and closer to the end of April, a non-weekly show. What that means is it's going to free me up to maybe every other week or every two weeks or whatever we decide it's going to be to put something else in its place. In fact, it's going to be like what Padres Quarter was at the beginning, a place for us to test out new formats, new content. Some of it will be good, some of it will miss, some of it will be bad, but... I think in doing this and, and freeing up those resources and freeing up those, those hours and that time, we're going to be able to get back to the original intent of Padres Corner. And that was to bring you content that we like to create, guests that you want to hear from, and uh, really, again, to put you in the mind of a Jesuit priest. I'm Father Robert Ballester, and until next time, good night from Padres Corner.